Welcome to Carolina Sculpture Studio. My name is Clint Button and I'm a granite sculptor. Uh, let's talk about hand machines today. There's uh, information out there, but it's uh, not always coming from people that earn a living carving with a hand machine. So uh, see if I can give you some good advice. Kachuri notes on their advertisement stuff that they've been making tools since the 1870s. Well, back in the 1870s, 1880s, technology still hadn't really caught up everywhere. And so even if you had a, you could buy a pneumatic tool, you may not have compressed air to run it. So it, it, they had a limited application in the beginning. They were very high tech and, and not really something that people used everywhere. By the 18, late 1880s, 1890s, compressed air was becoming far more available and applicable to, to different work. And so in, in the United States, that led to a real boon in, in uh, the granite industry, especially in Barrie, Vermont. So um, there's a company called Trout Holden in, in Barrie, Vermont that released the Barrie pneumatic tool. This is uh, circa 1900. This is one of the early ones. Um, and it was to compete with the Kachuri. Now, the Kachuri, you can see a little difference in the nose design. This is what I understand to be an early development or design towards the fingertip model because you could actually press against that with your fingertips. That really wears your fingertips out. That's not how I hold it. But with this, there was nothing there. And if you hold it way back here, that doesn't make any sense um, So for hard stone. So anyways, but that's, that's a Kachuri. This is an early berry tool. And then Barry superseded this with what they formally called the fingertip. And this is, you know, your fingers fit there very well. I still spend my time carving here. That's the least stressful way to hold the tool. You don't really squeeze it hard with your fist except for certain operations where you may be doing some rough work. For carving, I carve everything like this, and it's the least amount of stress on my hand. Now, this is a full-stroke machine. I bought it new during my apprenticeship. This is also a full stroke trout and holding three quarter inch D full stroke that I bought during my apprenticeship. I've worn both of these tools out over a period of 15 years or so. Um, and but I like the fingertip design a lot. And for that, you source that through Bicknell. Bicknell Supply out of Alberton. This is a, a Bicknell was up in Rockland, Maine, and they used to claim among the carvers that their tools were different. They were a little soft. They had a different elasticity. They feel different. Um, and they thought that was based on some of the tolerances of how the tool is actually manufactured inside. They don't make them anymore. They're produced by another company for Bicknell. And they've cleaned up those tolerances, so they perform basically like a trout and holden, but I still prefer this, this fingertip design because I think it's most comfortable and most tractable to use. Um, so that gives you a little bit of idea about the fingertip. The smaller tools are all this same Kachuri type tapered design, whether it's a Bicknell. This is a Rockland Main Bicknell. This is a little... Uh, Dallet out of Barrett Granite City Tool. Dallet used to be in Philadelphia, and now they're produced um, for Granite City Tool and, and, and stamped and everything. So, um, But the tools come in different sizes from the Bantams that are tiny, tiny up to um, inch and a quarter, which is about the biggest thing on the market now. Um, and uh, this is a lot of tool. It uses a different size shank. It's, it's a heavy tool to work with all day. You really got to be rugged to do it. But for some things, they, they're, they're really great to have. They used to make what they called hand tracers or bumpers. Now, this is an inch and a quarter machine, and this is a bumper uh, or a hand tracer. They're meat eaters. Boy, they'll, they'll, you get your finger under there with a four point and you'll wish you hadn't. Um, they had, these fell out of favor decades ago. They're just really a lot of machine to handle. And so, but these, I got a couple of old Dalit hand tracers as souvenirs of days gone by. Uh, this is a pistol grip machine out of Europe. I think it's an H and K. Um, haven't used it much. Um, it's a small, pretty small tool, but 
something I like about it. Sometimes you'll see people using a, a, a rotary hammer, a chipping hammer that's got a pistol grip uh, of some manner. And this tool has a trigger that's on the underside. A lot of the pistol grip tools have a backstrap actuator or a trigger so that when you push against this, the job and you're working, it helps limit fatigue because you don't have to, to squeeze a trigger. The problem with that if you're using it for a stone job where you're trying to carve is that it's hard to release the pressure on that trigger and control the tool at the same time. And those extra few hits that it may bump, 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 the last few hits, you know, that could ruin your job. So you don't want to do that. Um, having a trigger underneath makes it easy to release it and still control the tool. So that's something to think about. These are available online uh, over, you can get them from Europe. I don't know if there's a United States supplier or not, but um, they're, they're uh, a different, different way to do it. I mentioned the exhaust. You've got side exhaust, like on these tools or Kachuri. Early Trout and Holden had a rear exhaust. This is an exhaust fitting for a muffler. Trout and Holden offered this back in the, you know, 50 years ago or whatever. Hadn't made them for a long time. And you'd screw a fitting with a hose and it went to a canister muffler, like a coffee can size. And it would drag on the floor or wherever and make a mess. Um, quiets the machine down, but that wasn't a real practical way to do it. So what the people in the sheds would do is they'd just run a longer piece of hose, run a piece of hose 20 feet long up into the rafters or out the window, and it quiets the machine down tremendously. It just buzzes. It doesn't make any noise. And so uh, they're really nice. Trout hole doesn't offer them right now. Maybe if there was enough demand, they would. Um, but um, these were a couple that my sculptor had. The last two we had on old machines at the studio when I was apprenticing. So he gave them to me when I bought these machines and Trout and Holden put them on for me. So that's another option if you want to quiet down your tools. Um, when you buy these machines, they typically take, we used to figure it'd take three months of full-time use. That's three months, 40 hours a week running in order to break, break them in to bed this piston and the cylinder in together. Now, when you first buy them and run them, a brand new one, there won't be any air coming out of here. It'll be all solid. Um, if you, um, after you run them for a while, they start to break in and they get some air that comes out. And that air is very useful because you want to be able to, when you're working and you're carving or whatever you're doing, and you've got a bunch of loose stone on the, on the job, you can put your finger over the end and psh, blow all of it towards your suction and clear your stone off. Otherwise, you've got to get a, a broom or something like that and sweep it off, and that's not ideal. It's, it's a lot faster to do this. Now, as these tools age, they wear out. Um, I've seen stuff that says if the piston sticks are soaking in kerosene overnight, that's ridiculous. Um, that's not going to fix anything in here. It's just going to make your tool messy to clean up before you can carve stone. Um, I've seen things that said you're supposed to run your tool for a minute before you load it and put a chisel in. Now, if I did that every day, I'd spend at least 30 or 40 minutes and then put it in. I'd spend half an hour more a day. That, that's ridiculous. There's no reason to do that. You don't need to run it loose all the time, but it's not going to hurt it. A lot of guys used to turn the machines on and let them run all day long for days and days and days on end to break them in when they first got them. It doesn't destroy the machines. So, um, if you do decide to get a machine rebuilt, if you buy a used machine, this is something that's unique. If you see a machine that's green like this, that's original paint, Trout and Holden paints all their brand new hand machines green, so you know they're brand new, okay? Bicknell doesn't, Granite City Tool doesn't, they don't do that. Bick, uh, Trout and Holden does. If you buy a used machine, it may, be, it may run fine, maybe great. But if you turn it on and run it, and you can stall it by holding a chisel in, it's junk. That's what this one does, it's wore out. Now I can send this back to try and hold it and get it rebuilt. They'll put a new cylinder, redo the, redo the piston and cylinder in here, so everything's tight, just like brand new. Then I gotta start the break-in process all over again. Might break in great, it might not break in well at all. 
This machine was always a rough machine. We never liked it. This machine was perfect out of the box. And, and we bought them, I mean, I bought them personally right there, trial and holding, and there wasn't any special thing. We just grabbed them off the shelf. But this one was an unhappy machine until it quit. And this one, I, I really was sad when this one died because it, it was a wicked great machine. The problem with getting them rebuilt, if you buy a used machine, is that you're also going to have wear on the in the receiver where the tool will be loose and you're also likely to have wear on the nose because some people drag their tools a lot they wear them down a lot some people bang them really hard when they stall and they'll chip them so if you spend two-thirds or three-quarters of the money for a brand new machine to get an old one rebuilt and it's already worn out down here, you might as well just get a new machine and then you know what you've got. Um, now, as far as plumbing the tool or hooking the tool up, you always, always have to have a steel bushing because what will happen is this will vibrate back and forth if it ever gets loose and it'll erode the teeth in here until the teeth are no longer viable and it, your tools jump, you throw it away, you can't fix it. Um, so that's not any good. If you, so you put your bushing in and then there's some different ways to do this. And I've never been a fan of the quick release. That's not how I was trained and in practice I found it doesn't work as well. You want a brass fitting to screw into your steel so that if anything sacrifices, this is soft enough that the threads will get eroded on this brass piece and not on your bushing. If you put a male, you know, you put your fitting on for a quick release, um, there's a, a few issues with that. The quick release isn't really designed to absorb that much vibration and it'll end up vibrating to the point that it fails. A problem that isn't as obvious is that you're making this tool another three inches or so, four inches or so long. And you're making it long in a way that you'll probably push against it at some point when you're carving and you'll end up breaking off the nipple going into your hose or you'll break off the nipple going into the steel and it's still a failure. So instead of doing all that, just eliminate it, put a regular fitting on there and go with it. Now, it depends on your reach. I've got a, maybe a three foot long section between this and the air valve. I like to have an air valve that's a 90 degree valve on and off. And I'd prefer to have a fitting like this with a lever because I can turn it. And if it's really close and you want to get to that sweet spot, sometimes you just bump it and that'll give you just exactly what you want. And you can't do that with a knob. Um, knobs are hard to deal with with gloves or, or cold weather or and they don't last as long um, I'd rather have a, a ball valve in there uh, even if it's a modern one versus one of the old brass ones so I think that covers most of it um, you you it's just really important to understand your tools what you're getting what you're not getting and what they'll do uh, a short stroke tool machine one of these kachuris will carve marble twice as fast yeah, maybe not twice as fast but almost twice as fast as a full stroke machine and vice versa on hard stone a long stroke or full stroke machine will just go right through hard stone and it'll it'll soft stone will shut it down um, so don't buy a, a short stroke machine because you're afraid of a long stroke machine it really needs to be based upon what you're carving i carve limestone marble granite and more in studio and so i have short stroke machines for soft stone because i carve faster with them i have full stroke machines for hard stone because i carve faster with them and that's from side by side comparisons i don't you don't i don't think there's a big benefit of having a short stroke machine for doing fine work in granite i'd rather shift from a three quarter to a half inch and uh that's a full stroke and you'll get a lot better control and a lot better performance. So, um, but I hope this gives you some insight and to what you're going to buy and what you're going to use. And if you, you know, if you have a chance to lay hands on tools before you buy them, that's always good. 
Um, I wanted to lay some tools out here so y'all could see them side by side and get an idea of what's out there and uh, some of the benefits, pluses and minuses to what's available. So um, that's about it. We'll do a video on chisels and some other stuff and uh, to go with this. So, But until then, my name's Clint Button here at Carolina Sculpture Studio. Thanks for coming in.